It's one of the most important elections in the history of Indianapolis. Choosing the mayor for the next four years at a pivotal time for the city. Should the current mayor get a third term? I don't dwell on those things that, have al that we've already achieved. I never have. Rather, all I can see are the things left undone. Or be replaced by a former city county council member and businessman. Our city is drifting under this administration, and it's not okay just to mark time. It is not okay just to go through the motions. Indianapolis must confront huge questions about crime, the murder rate, public safety, jobs, health, and neighborhoods. Today I stand before you to share another vision, one for economic growth. One Vision wants you to believe that the best way to go forward in Indianapolis is to go back to the good old days. We have to get public safety right or none of the other pieces can fall into place. You have my commitment that I'll be damned if I'm gonna let someone drag us back into the past. Tonight, Indiana's best political team takes your questions directly to Joe Hogsett and Jefferson Shreve to get the answers you demand before casting your ballot. From Wish TV, your exclusive home for Indiana's best political coverage. This is a special edition of All Indiana Politics, the Indianapolis mayoral debate. And good evening and thank you for joining us for this News 8 special. We are proud to host this debate in the Indianapolis mayoral race. It's the first live one hour televised debate in this race and the first one in a mayoral race in nearly 20 years. We want to welcome in the two candidates, Democrat Joe Hogsett, who is hoping to win his third term in office and Republican Jefferson Shreve, a businessman who has previously served on a city county council. And before we begin tonight, let's give you a couple of the ground rules that both candidates have agreed to. There will be no opening statements. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer a question. They may request the 30 second rebuttal. We may also ask follow up questions with 30 second answers. And to end the debate, each candidate will have up to 90 seconds for a closing statement. And with that, gentlemen, let's begin tonight by talking crime and public safety. It was the number one topic in questions submitted by our viewers. For the past three years, we've heard about record homicide rates in the city, growing fears about crime in neighborhoods, and watch the downtown riots in 2020. So let's start here. Do you believe in Indianapolis that it's a safe city? Do you believe that downtown is safe? By virtue of a coin flip, Mr. Hogsett, you start us off tonight. 60 seconds, sir. Well, I certainly believe that downtown is the safest neighborhood in all of Indianapolis. Uh, statistics and data uh, show that to be the case. We try to desperately uh, make all of our neighborhoods as safe, uh, but that we have a safe downtown and generally speaking, we have a safe city. Now, the truth is we have a problem with guns and uh, everybody has guns. Uh, the permitless carry that was passed by the Indiana General Assembly uh, has been particularly difficult for the city of Indianapolis. There are more guns in our city then there are people. And until and unless we start uh, meaningfully addressing those issues, we're gonna continue to have uh, unfortunate uh, incidents of gun violence. And uh, gun violence uh, brings with it uh, perception problems. And that's why uh, we need to change the direction uh, and, uh, and make a real difference in the gun uh, availability of guns. All right, Mr. Shreve, 60 seconds to you, your response. Too much of our downtown is not safe or does not feel safe, does not feel inviting to people from our city who share in the common neighborhood that we call downtown, whether they come from Pike Township or Perry Township or Lawrence Township. Perception is reality, but that perception is evidenced in the reality of too much crime, whether it be petty crime, violent crime in our urban core. Statistically, the IMPD downtown district is by far the smallest uh, geographically, and so it's distorting to say that it is our safest district from a policing standpoint. Uh, but it certainly has uh, a heavy allocation of resources. Okay. We have a safety problem in downtown, and it deters people from 
from enjoying the common core, Mr. the common Shreve, neighborhood of thank our city. you. You're out of time. Mr. Mr. Mayor, would you like to rebut? I'd simply say that uh, downtown is extraordinarily safe, uh, regardless of its uh, geographic uh, uh, circumference. Uh, and it's important to know that uh, uh, we are putting more resources into public safety, $150 million over three years. Uh, and I think uh, that the statistics show that crime is down across the board, not just, just in murders, uh, but also in, uh, in burglaries, uh, robberies, uh, non-fatal shootings and the like. 30 seconds to you, Mr. Shreve, rebuttal. Uh, uh, Nonviolent crimes as reported are down because we have too few officers on our force. We're more than 320 officers short. and so. The IMPD has had to make necessary cutbacks and, for example, they don't pursue auto theft investigations. The ability to police, the broken window theory of, of, of policing is a reality in Indianapolis. And so reports of, of crime on these fronts is underreported. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you. Both of you have talked about getting more IMPD officers on the force and on the streets to help address crime. So how exactly do you plan to hire more officers when nearly every major city in the country has the same problem? Mr. Shreve. Uh, this is a problem shared by other cities, but Indianapolis acutely. Uh, we uh, have lost 880 officers uh, to other departments from the IMPD, either to early retirements, but oftentimes they just go to departments where they feel better led, better better supported and backed. And so this is a leadership deficit challenge, not a fiscal challenge, because these positions are funded and authorized by our city council that I served upon. Uh, mechanically, I will work to increase the age at which someone can go into the policing profession to age 40 rather than 35, but we must make this department a point of pride on which to serve in the capital city, the only first class city of Indianapolis, and it starts with leadership of that department. Mr. Shreve, thank you. Mr. Mr. Hogsett, your response. Well, the truth is, over the last eight years, we have hired over 700 officers. In fact, 45% of IMPD officers who are working for IMPD today were hired by my administration. I'm proud of that. Now, while uh, it would be great to have additional officers, and that's the, the efforts that we are making, uh, when uh, Jefferson mentions that we're 300 officers uh, below where we'd like to be, uh, what he doesn't uh, mention is we're 300 officers that I authorized and fully funded. These are positions that wouldn't be there but for me. And the truth is also, in uh, Jefferson's time on the council, uh, Mayor Ballard went two years without hiring a single officer. One of those years, Jefferson was on the council and voted for his budget, hiring no officers at all. Mr. Shreve, would you like to rebut? I would. I would. 30 uh, seconds. Go ahead. We've had benefit of some uh, uh, ARPA money for an additional 100 officers, which we've not been able to take advantage of for lack of hiring, for lack of the leadership with which to hire those people. I served on the IMPD Staffing Commission, and I did support the budgets of prior administrations, including this mayor's, to provide the resources to staff these positions. And we have significantly increased the starting rates for, 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 for first-year patrolmen, but still not been effective in hiring them. Mr. Mayor, you get 30 more seconds to respond, and then we'll move on to the next question. Go ahead, sir. Well, the truth is, is that 300 additional officers uh, and positions have been fully funded. When I first ran for office, uh, I proposed adding 150 officers, and the press corps wanted to know where I was going to get the money. Well, now here we are eight years later. We have 300 positions that are fully funded. We just uh, are having difficulty, like the rest of the country, the rest of the urban areas in finding people who want to be police officers. But we have raised the first year and second year pay and we'll continue to do so. 
All right, gentlemen, for many communities in our city, simply putting more officers on the street does not address the issue of how officers do their jobs. What do you say to those communities, especially communities of color who worry about over-policing in certain neighborhoods? I'll start with you, Mayor Hogsett. Yeah, I think the accountability of IMPD officers and the department as a whole are, is very important. That's why we are the first administration who has uh, provided body cams for every IMPD officer. In the 2024 operating budget, we're going to be giving them uh, dash cams so that their actions can be uh, monitored and, 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 and held accountable where that's appropriate. We're the administration who introduced a use of force policy. We're the administration who brought civilian majority uh, use of force board. We're the administration that brought civilian uh, majority general orders committee. So I think in the area of accountability and transparency, uh, our record is clear and distinct. All right, Mr. Shreve, how would you like to respond? All communities in Indianapolis want to be safe and live in a civil, in a civil community. None want to be over-policed, but uh, minority communities uh, do want to be safe and protected. And this administration has been, in my view, slow to adopt the technology that the mayor uh, vaunts. We were one of the last departments uh, to adopt body cameras. I served on the body camera commission eight years ago. We were very slow to roll that out. We have dash cameras on 25 squad cars today. Yes, we have money in the budget for next year to get 750 cameras in, but we are trailing, tra we trail from an innovation and the implementation of technology in this department under the Hogshead administration and police officers are hungry for that technology. Now, we've also heard the complaint for the past couple of years about what critics call a revolving door in the Marion County criminal justice system. Criminals arrested only to be quickly released and commit other crimes. We've even heard that criticism recently from Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. Is that a fair criticism? What changes, if any, do you want to see made in the Marion County judicial system? And I'll start with you, um, Mr. Shreve. The, the criticism is uh, very fair, and I have uh, throatily in, uh, agreed with Superintendent Carter uh, in his call for a complete review of the criminal justice ecosystem, if you will, in Marion County. While the mayor directly controls the funding and the staffing and budget for the IMPD, he's got to work with an independently elected prosecutor, members of the judiciary, uh, and the sheriff's department. And the system, the ecosystem, is not working, as Superintendent Carter has pointed out. If elected mayor, I will use this office, I will use my voice, the bully pulpit, to advocate for a working criminal justice system that will close that revolving door to take the violent serial offenders off of the streets of Indianapolis. And I will direct the same question to you, Mr. Hoxett. Well, I uh, have known, uh, I've known Doug Carter for many years and think the world of him. Uh, and I'm always open to um, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, positions and uh, his experience, and this is no different. Uh, the truth is, is that that is why, in no small measure, because I think we do need added uh, enforcement. Uh, why, as part of my criminal uh, justice plan, has been to add three additional special assistant United States attorneys to the United States Attorney's office, working with the United States Attorney in pursuit of violent crime and particularly gun violence uh, here in Marion County. Uh, I think that uh, because the federal prosecutor has so many more tools at, uh, at his or her uh, availability, uh, I think that will make a profound difference in the criminal justice system here in Marion County. You know, another key part of the discussion on crime, gentlemen, here in Indianapolis is the prevalence of, of guns in the city. And state lawmakers eliminated Indiana's requirement for licenses to carry a handgun. Do you believe permitless carry of handguns has made the crime situation better or worse here in Indianapolis? Mr. Mayor, your turn, sir. 60 seconds. 
Well, there's absolutely no question, and I think there's uniform agreement that permitless carry has been disastrous, particularly for Indianapolis, uh, where no one needs a permit. Uh, I would go so far, and the city county council has agreed with me, that, that we need to repeal concealed carry as well. Uh, and, and so permitless carry has done really nothing more than put guns in the hands of the people who have absolutely no business possessing a handgun uh, or any other type of weapon of that nature. And I want to be clear about that because responsible gun owners have nothing to fear. It is those who are misusing the availability of guns uh, that I think we need to focus our attention on. So uh, if the legislature would permit it, uh, I think that their preemption in this area needs to be repealed, and we already have the ordinance on the books. Mr. Shreve, 60 seconds to you, same question. Uh, of course, that ordinance uh, has no weight of law. It is toothless, uh, and it was introduced 10 days after the General Assembly adjourned a long session in my view, a little too late, uh, late in the second term of an administration if it truly cared about this. Uh, I believe uh, in the lawful right of citizens to possess a handgun. Were I a legislator, which I am not, I would have been compelled by the testimony of Superintendent Doug Carter and our IMPD chief who advocated for keeping the permitting requirements for concealed carry of weapons in place. And in the true and proper order of things, I would advocate for the reinstatement of that permitting requirement for concealed carry of weapons as part of my legislative package that I would take before the General Assembly at the start of the session, not after it had adjourned. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, let me just, Mr. Uh, 30 let seconds, sir. Let me just clarify one thing. Uh, Jefferson has, uh, uh, has criticized uh, me in terms of the late in the second term before I said anything about permitless carry. Uh, what he doesn't tell you is permitless carry was not the law until just a year ago. Uh, so I think that uh, that certainly uh, uh, needs to be known uh, because if, uh, if he's going to suggest that I was doing nothing for seven years, well, in no small measure, it's because there, there was no such thing as permitless carry. Mr. Shreve, you have 30 seconds to rebuttal, if you would like it. Well, uh, well this didn't sneak up on us. Uh, this had been uh, advocated for and was coming down the pike at the General Assembly for some years. And this administration certainly had the opportunity to put that at the top of its legislative advocacy package at the start of the long session, rather than 10 days after it adjourned. Okay, gentlemen, we mentioned the downtown riots earlier. It was obviously a key moment of the past four years. An independent review blamed, among other things, a lack of planning, coordination, and communication by IMPD and the city. It also found police actions escalated the tensions that we saw that weekend in 2020. There have also been lingering questions about your role, Mr. Hogsett, in that weekend's response. So, Mr. Hogsett, we'll go to you on this one again. Uh, let's ask this. Do you agree with the report findings that there was a lack of planning, coordination, and communication and where were you on the night of the riots? Well, first of all, the question uh, about uh, the report, I uh, embraced it uh, because I put the committee together, Deborah Daniels and former Justice Myra Selby and Sean Huddleston, the president of Martin University, did a very thorough job. My office fully participated. Uh, and in, in answer to your second question, uh, Phil, uh, I was, uh, working uh, from my home. Uh, I was in constant contact uh, with my representatives, uh, with IMPD. Uh, I, uh, after things uh, started to dissipate that evening, I got about two or three hours of uh, rest and got up at four o'clock the next day, worked the rest of the weekend, meeting with uh, organizers of the protests, and ultimately issued uh, uh, the order to. Uh, uh, to have the, uh, the, the uh, protests ended, and uh, that was effective. Uh, it was George Floyd changed the world, not just Indianapolis. George Floyd and his death changed the world. And I'm glad to say that we've had 300, uh, 300 protests since then without incident. Okay. 
Mr. Shreve, 60 seconds to you, sir. Well, that all sounds very commendable. It just doesn't sound consistent with all accounts that, that, that I have heard from others that were very much on the scene and wrestling with that situation, many of which members of the IMPD and the 911 uh, Staffing Center and the governor's office. Uh, we had a terrific mess on our hands, and the mayor wasn't on the scene. I don't know if he was just working from home I can tell you that a Mayor Shreve would have been on the scene, whether in an emergency command center or at least on the 25th floor of the city county building, because that's, that's how you lead. Mr. Hogsett, I'm sure you would like your 30 second rebuttal. Well, uh, the fact is, is that uh, I was in constant communication with both IMPD uh, command staff as well as my own staff uh, who were at the emergency uh, command center. And uh, Jefferson may be able to, to, to allege that he would have been on site. I'm not altogether sure what either he or I could have done uh, in terms of wading out into the crowd. Uh, I don't think uh, that would have been responsible. But in, in, in any event, I was in touch and listening to everything that was going on and giving direction accordingly. Mr. Shreve, Mr. Shreve, would you like your 30 seconds? Yes, thank you. Uh, our police officers are trained to protect people and property. And they will tell you to a T that they were ordered to stand aside, to let it rip. And that was just unacceptable. It was damaging to the morale of the members of our IMPD that has been scarring and left long-term effects on the makeup of our force, and I'm certain that has driven some members from our force to other departments. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Now, parts of downtown have struggled to recover from the pandemic. Many downtown offices remain empty for remote work, and many of the businesses have faced difficulties. What needs to be done to fully revive downtown? I'll start with you, Mr. Shreve. Uh, the w patterns in which people work today have changed, will change. Uh, they will not go back to the, the fully staffed offices that we might have enjoyed uh, when I began my work at the corner of Illinois and Ohio Street 30-odd uh, years ago. And we have to accept that reality. Uh, we're not going to tax the citizens of Marion County to incent employers to try to get people to work at desks five days a week when there are other ways in which we work. We've got to be proactive and creative in repurposing uh, spaces that we have downtown to make it attractive to live increasingly as well as work, shop, and play in our downtown core. And I'll ask you the same question, Mr. Hogsett. Yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the most important things that we need to keep in mind is the world uh, has changed uh, and uh, the work, five day work week uh, with commuters coming in from around uh, probably will never return to its uh, pre-pandemic existence. But here's the good news, 25 million, or excuse me, 25,000 new residents uh, have uh, now called downtown home. The downtown resiliency strategy uh, was launched by Downtown Indy as the result of $3.5 million that the city gave it. So our recovery is going to be, and, and by the way, it's important to, to underscore that the city uh, was a leader in encouraging people to return to work downtown. And, and I, I am uh, sure that that is now uh, going to be uh, continuing. Uh, and it's that kind of leadership that will encourage people to re return downtown. Uh, residential and work experience, uh, that's what's going to revive our city. Mr. Shreve, would you like to offer up a rebuttal at this time? Well, I would uh, rather I would append to that and say that people have to feel safe in living and working and playing downtown. And so we have to address that broken part of our foundation if we are going to be successful at growing our downtown neighborhoods. We do have a, about a third of our core that is growing in that fashion, but too much of it is not. And at the root of that obstacle, that impediment, are, 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 are feelings of a lack of safety that our citizens wrestle with. And Mr. Hawk said you have 30 seconds if you'd like to issue your rebuttal. 
Yeah, I would simply underscore that the people that are uh, living downtown uh, are coming downtown to live because it is safe. And you don't hear complaints from people who live downtown because they know it's safe. Where you hear the complaints, and this is who Jefferson is listening to, are people who don't even live in Marion County. They live in the contiguous counties. Now, I want them to return to downtown for a wide variety of different reasons, not the least of which spending money. But uh, the people who live downtown will tell you they feel safe. Gentlemen, the city has experimented with spark on the circle, closing down part of the circle to traffic and hosting what amounts to a green space. Mr. Hogg said, should that continue in 2024 and should the entire circle be closed to traffic? Well, I think that closing a quarter of the circle is a good pilot uh, to, to view and that will be um, ended, I think, in early to mid-November, and we'll just see what the statistics are. I think it has been enormously popular. Anytime you provide public space uh, in the downtown area, I think you're going to encourage people to return downtown. And it's not just Spark. I mean, uh, I'm very proud of the bicentennial uh, plaza that is now opened up and will be part of our another public space, uh, the repurposing and the revitalization of Georgia Street. I think will have a profound impact on uh, people having fun and playing and going to restaurants and returning to our music uh, venues. Uh, all of these things uh, combined to one another are part of the downtown resiliency strategy and I think that they are key to the growth and the revitalization of our downtown in the post-pandemic era. Mr. Shreve, 60 seconds, your response. I think experimentation with uh, novel programs is good, healthy, and just fine. And what we're doing with Spark uh, was an interesting experiment. Uh, what concerns me about the notion of Spark is the mayor's characterization as a potential pilot, a precursor to closure of Monument Circle to vehicular traffic. It's, it's proved difficult to close one quarter of the circle and not materially affect movement around the whole of the circle. And I definitely would not be in favor of the closure of Monument Circle to vehicular traffic. It ought to be safe for both uh, bicyclists, pedestrians, and vehicles and reopened once this novel experiment has concluded. Okay, gentlemen, good conversation. Thank you very much. We're gonna take a quick break. We have much more ahead in the next 30 minutes, including housing. Here in Indianapolis, you're watching our All Indiana Politics special, the Indianapolis Mayoral Debate. The home of Indiana's best political team, Wish TV. We are local. And welcome back to this All Indiana Politics special, the Indianapolis Mayoral Debate. We are joined by Democrat Joe Hogsett and Republican Jefferson Shreve. Now, I want to start this half hour discussing housing. A study by the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana found entire blocks are being bought by outside investors, often with cash. Critics believe this type of buying drives up home purchase prices and rents in neighborhoods. What do you think can be done or should be done to limit outside investor purchase power? Mr. Shreve. Uh, I would recognize that that is a problem increasingly in neighborhoods, not just in our urban core, but in our townships as well. Healthy neighborhoods have a high percentage of individual home ownership, and so we want to discourage, uh, discourage outside investors buying up big swaths of housing stock. We also want to encourage local home ownership, and there are programs under the Community Reinvestment Act that we want to encourage our lending community to support people to own their housing. Indianapolis has been attractive as a place to live because it was a relatively low cost community. But our costs of housing, uh, rents in particular, are going up about 8% a year. We have to add to the supply materially to catch up with the demand so, that, so, so they come into parity and cost increases will come down. And there are things that the mayor can do through the Department of Metropolitan Development and Business and Neighborhood Services to rectify that. All right, well, Mr. Um, Hawk said, how would you like to respond to that? Well, I certainly uh, agree with Jefferson as it relates to 
uh, housing uh, supply. I mean, housing is such a critical issue, you can't have enough of it. That's why this administration has been uh, very proactive in terms of uh, providing more affordable housing for more people throughout the, uh, the state. Now, as far as out-of-state uh, landlords, uh, frankly, we have a, a good track record and a cooperative record with working with the Attorney General and citizens uh, in apartment complexes throughout the uh, state, holding out-of-state landlords who have pocketed monies that they have no business pocketing and not paying their water bills. We held them accountable, and I'm very uh, grateful for that success. So uh, at the end of the day, we've also been responsible for a one-time property tax credit for 90% of homeowners to keep them in their homes and the anti-displacement pilot project going on over in the Riverside Park area. I'm proud of that too. All right, so Indiana has some of the worst eviction rates in the nation with people of color being impacted at higher rates. Aside from the housing task force, what will you do to address housing equity in the city over the next four years? And this go around, we'll start again with you, Mr. Hogsett. Yes, I, uh, I know that uh, several years back, uh, the City County Council uh, passed uh, significant uh, pro-rental uh, relief uh, for renters who were being manipulated by unscrupulous landlords. Uh, that, I think, passed in a bipartisan uh, way, at least at the council. What happened? Um, well, entities took our legislation and went over to the Indiana General Assembly and they essentially told us uh, that it was uh, not part of their program and did away with it. Uh, that's very frustrating and that's what we face uh, all too often. I am proud though of the uh, nearly uh, 200, uh, 200 million dollars uh, that went into uh, uh, indie rents to keep people in their rental homes during the roughest days of the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Hogsett. And Mr. Shreve, how would you like to respond to, to that? Um, I think we have to recognize that some of the COVID era dollars, including the Indy Rents program, uh, will sunset uh, in the very near term. And so that pathway won't be there. Uh, the council and I supported the landlord registration uh, with the council, was well intentioned, but too many of the ordinances that we pass aren't enforced. Uh, we have a, uh, an ineffective business and neighborhood services program, uh, formerly called the Department of Code Enforcement. And so, you know, it's, these, are, these are just toothless initiatives that we take that don't serve to truly protect many of the citizens that are renters in our community. Uh, minority ownership of uh, housing in Marion County has declined decade after decade, every decade since 1940. We need to reverse that trend line around because that equity in one's home is a primary safety net that people enjoy or don't enjoy and can put them out in the street if they, if they miss a paycheck or two. And Mr. Hoxa, would you like to give your 30 second mm -hmm. rebuttal? Yeah, I just simply say that to the extent that uh, anything that we've done during my administration, uh, if it has been, as Jefferson has characterized it, toothless uh, and or ineffective, um, if, that were, if that were true, I'm not altogether sure the Indiana General Assembly would have gone so far to essentially uh, render it null and void. Uh, I mean, th those folks are smart enough to realize that if something's toothless, they don't need to do anything about it. Mr. Shreve, 30 seconds to you, sir. Uh, I, I've never known anyone uh, to um, <laughs> be per pursued for lack of having a rental property registered or not registered with the city of Indianapolis. There is no enforcement mechanism at the Department of Business and Neighborhood Services. Uh, that department is sorely uh, understaffed as are so many other departments in our city, and I would argue that it's been ineffectively managed. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. I want to turn the conversation now to health and equity uh, here, and inequality, rather, here in Indianapolis, okay? So we're going to talk about some numbers here. This is according to an IU study, okay? So um, we're looking at a map here. 
right around our station here uh, on Meridian Street, uh, life expectancy for folks around here, a community that's about uh, mostly black, mostly Hispanic, about 66 years old. Okay, so you move up a couple of miles, you go up north to Carmel, where it's about 75% white. Life expectancy there, 91 years old. So I'll address this uh, next question to you, Mr. Shree, first. Um, how do you plan to change this? And also, what do you plan to do if you are elected uh, when it comes to the underprivileged communities across our area? Go ahead, sir, 60 seconds. I would, one, acknowledge that that is an extraordinary disparity uh, I had some involvement with IU Health on a, a precursor regional board for Clarion and was on the uh, foundation, uh, capital foundation for IU Health with our big downtown campus until I stepped away to become a candidate for mayor. Uh, IU Health and our other institutions are working vigorously to correct this societal wrong, this societal injustice that is evidenced by the stats that you put up on the board. We have to do a better job in Marion County toward harmonizing those life expectancies with Hamilton County and our other donut counties. I have some understanding and some years of involvement with that and will work vigorously to move in that direction. Mr. Hogsett, your time, sir, 60 seconds. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> the disparities that you point out uh, are uh, many-headed. Uh, one is available and affordable home ownership, uh, and that is what we have been aggressive in trying to provide uh, more residents throughout the, the community. Um, it also involves, as Jefferson has just indicated, health access. But it's not just uh, IU Health and health access that is going to solve this disparity. This disparity, over the long run, Will be, uh, will be addressed in meaningful ways by providing better jobs and more jobs to more people with better wages. And that's what we have fought for. It also will be addressed by better educational opportunity. That's why I'm proud of Project Indy, which started under my administration. That's why I'm proud of Indy Achieves, our scholarship program. Uh, for under, uh, 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 underserved populations. Those are important steps to take. And I want us to talk about food deserts now. The most recent numbers from Indy Food Policy show as of last year, more than 208,000 Indianapolis residents live in a food desert, an area where access to fresh and nutritious food is severely limited. And we know this has a tremendous impact on health, especially that of children. What is your plan to help get more people access to fresh, nutritious food over the next four years? I'll start with you, Mr. Hogsett. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, food deserts uh, are very, very uh, concerning where they exist, and that's why this administration has been, I think, nimble and creative. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, uh, let's just uh, answer the question by more bricks and mortar. That's just not realistic. Sure, adding a grocery store or a supermarket where it can be financially successful ought to be included. I was very proud to, very early in my first term to to help open up Clio's Bodega. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, the investment that Cook Medical has made out on East 38th Street, where there's now a, uh, a, a food access. But we've been nimble in uh, the administration by providing, uh, for example, the Compass app, where people can go uh, online and figure out where their closest food access is. Or our Lyft program, where you can get for $1 a ride to and from a supermarket. That's the kind of creativity that will help us address this systemic issue. Mr. Shreve, you have 60 seconds. What is your take? The challenge is, is uh, broad. Uh, I've, I was in actually Cleo's bodega 10 days ago, uh, and it's a fine, small, but very limited example of what we need to do to approach both the food and I would also note sort of pharmaceutical deserts that we have increasingly around Marion County. Uh, I don't think the answer is to build new bricks and mortar uh, uh, stores, but rather to repurpose many of the vacant or disused uh, former retail boxes that we have around Marion County and to provide a set predictable package of redevelopment incentives for investor developers to bring in compact, mid-size 
grocers that offer fresh uh, produce and vegetables close into the communities that are underserved. And I have in mind specifically some of the many empty disused Walgreens or CVS stores or Rite Aid stores. They can't all become Dollar Trees, but they're just the right size to offer a good alternative to convenience store foods. You know, gentlemen, for the past few weeks, we've been asking our viewers to send us their questions for tonight. And this one was addressed to both of you. Um, how are you going to tackle large groups of people taking over the streets and parking lots doing spin outs uh, with their cars and blocking traffic? Something that we've extensively covered here on Wish TV, specifically our ride teammates Richard Essex, who's reported on it several times. Mr. Shreve, it's your turn, sir. 60 seconds. Start us off. Yeah, well, the, the question is timely. I did an IMPD ride along in. Uh, uh, North District last Saturday night and uh, I spent some time at the former Sears parking lot with uh, about a dozen of our officers and a sergeant responding to an incident just like that and we've had incidents just like that along MLK. Uh, on the south side uh, we have people speeding up and down uh, US 31. It is unacceptable uh, and it is a function of a uh, dearth of sufficient police horsepower on the streets to abate that problem. It takes a lot of officers deployed in a coordinated fashion to disperse those uh, crowds that cause that sort of chaos in the core of our city and in the, in the periphery of our city. We just need more police on the street to be forward facing and that's where that 320 odd delta between what we have and what we need comes into play. Okay. Mr. Hogsett? Well, spit outs uh, have finally uh, come to our city and uh, they have created uh, pr problems. But uh, I'm very proud of, speaking of uh, Superintendent Doug Carter and some of his ideas, uh, we, we have entered into a very close working relationship uh, with uh, the state police. The state police and IMPD. Uh, working together in those instances where these spinouts uh, oftentimes occur, uh, along with, by the way, neighborhoods. Na neighbors in those areas uh, are profoundly impacted and have been extraordinarily cooperative uh, and disclosive about the problems. Uh, and so, neighbors and state police and IMPD all working together, I think at last count, I knew that. Uh, a dozen or so arrests have already been made, and maybe since my last uh, uh, information, maybe even more arrests have been made. So they're addressing the problem, and I think um, uh, quite adequately. Uh, may I rebut? Go ahead. 30 seconds to you, sir. I don't think that we're addressing it adequately. I think it's a recurring problem, and the Indiana State Police have thankfully come to our rescue, but the IMPD ought to have the resources to deal with problems within the city of Indianapolis such as this. Uh, the IMPD is stifled by the pursuit limitations and it keeps them from going after uh, some of the perpetrators as they jump onto I-69 as they leave the, 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 the Castleton Square parking lot where the, I, the ISP don't have that prohibition. These are structural problems and these are human staffing problems. Mr. That Hogsett, would you like to respond, 30 seconds? Well, just uh, simply to say that Jefferson and I are going to have to agree to disagree. I think that uh, the answer uh, that uh, we all want is peace in our streets uh, and people held accountable for violating uh, our laws. And that's precisely what this cooperative arrangement between IMPD and the state police uh, is, uh, is doing. Uh, and it's. Uh, I, I think uh, the answer uh, in cooperation with neighbors who are willing to assist uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we, we can uh, continue to make success in this area. All right, so I want to turn to mental health. A report released by IU earlier this month estimated that last year, 26,000 adults in Marion County had serious mental illness but did not get treatment. That's two out of every three people with a serious mental illness, and 55,000 did not get treatment for substance abuse disorder. The report also cited transportation, housing, and minoritized communities as challenges to access care. What do you plan to do? over the next four years to improve mental health care treatment and access in Indianapolis. Mr. Hogsett, I'll give you the question first. 
Well, thank you. Uh, I'm proud that uh, in the last uh, several years during the Hogshead administration, uh, we have increased our funding for mental health uh, and mental health access and mental health care uh, by three times. Uh, we are the administration that has offered uh, for our community the first time the clinician-led uh, response teams. Uh, and that started the 1st of July. Uh, it now uh, operates in downtown. It will be uh, scaling up uh, to East District uh, in short order. Uh, and I think that's something the community asked for that we have been able to uh, fund and provide. And then finally, our assessment and intervention center at the Community Justice Campus is an incredible asset to mental health. And that's why in next year's budget, will be increasing from 30 uh, to 60 beds at the Assessment and Intervention Center. Uh, that will be profoundly important as well. All right, and so Mr. Shreve, I'll ask you um, that same question. How would you like to respond? 60 seconds here. We have acutely under, an under invested in mental health. Our city uh, isn't awash in extra cash, although we've had some unusual influx from COVID dollars lately, but dollars spent on the front end of addressing mental health challenges save our community significantly more on the other end of the equation. We have one mobile clinician-led unit. That's not nearly enough. It's estimated that 80% of IMPD runs have a mental health component to each call. And our police officers are not trained as social workers. They too often play that role, but that's not their core competency. I will advocate for and draft a budget as mayor that will invest materially more in mental health because I think that dollar for dollar, those would be dollars well spent on the front end versus what we spend on the back end. Thank you both, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time, gentlemen. I want to get one more question, though. I want to ask you about an issue that doesn't get much attention in, in much campaigns, many campaigns, I should say, but seems to have become one this year. Animal welfare. We've uh, highlighted plans to improve Indianapolis animal care services. Uh, the, we've done a lot of reporting on that from both of you, including the plans for a, a new shelter. So what do you want to do, and, and how big of a priority is it compared to other issues? Mr. Shreve, your turn to start us off here. 60 seconds, sir. Yeah, I suppose I may have shown the spotlight on this problem, uh, and it wasn't a partisan sort of play. And from a political standpoint, it was certainly a niche sort of uh, subject of interest. But what we do, or moreover don't do, from the standpoint of animal care services in Indianapolis is shameful. Uh, my wife and I uh, have a, a rescue dog. Uh, and I have been out to ACS in the past as a, as a council member. Went out to check a look at the conditions out there on a public adoption day recently because I knew as a candidate I, I, I couldn't just nose around. And what I saw, thinking it would be a public facing day, was uh, just, just disastrous in terms of the conditions that the animals were living in. Um, by a report issued back in 17, that shelter is about one third the size of what it needs to be. The uh, adoptions uh, aren't where they need to be. We don't take uh, animals uh, other than by appointment, which means too many strays are left on the streets, are not dropped in or cared for. Too few animal control officers. Uh, we have to do a better job okay. than we do. Mr. Sharif, thank you. Mr. Hogsett, your response, 60 seconds. Well, as a pet owner, this is very personal uh, to me. And uh, I understand that uh, there has been delays. We have uh, the funding available because of, uh, I think, uh, the fiscal prudence of this administration. We have the funding available uh, to uh, build a, uh, a state-of-the-art uh, new shelter. Uh, that has been in the works for some time. I'm frustrated that it is not already underway, but the site that was originally uh, uh, identified uh, became problematic, and so we've had to uh, delay the actual construction of that shelter uh, a bit. But I'm proud to say that when I took uh, over as mayor uh, eight years ago, our live re release rate from the animal care and control shelter was about 60%. Uh, during the course of the Hogshead administration, those figures have been as high as 85 to 90% live release rates. 
that's progress, and I'd like it to be 100%. That's the goal. We do have time for rebuttal if you would like, Mr. Shreve. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, well, uh, we are taking in uh, fewer animals because you have to have an appointment to drop one off or to adopt an animal. This past Saturday, the shelter was closed. That's the busiest day for adoptions. Uh, and I got word of that and actually happened by there and did a Facebook post on it, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, my approach will be one to, do, as I have said, I'll donate my salary as mayor to animal care services. Uh, I Unfortunately, we're running out of time, Mr. Shreve. I want to get Mr. Hogsett in here as well. Go ahead, sir, 30 seconds. Well, I'm just, uh, I, I, this is a very emotional issue for all of us who, who love our pets. And that's why we are uh, prioritizing this uh, as a, um, as a, the funds are there and the funds are available. We need to identify the new location for our shelter, uh, begin to build it and have it in place uh, and keep raising the live release rates. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We want to thank you for answering our questions tonight. It's now time for closing statements. And as per our guidelines, each candidate has up to 90 seconds for a closing statement by virtue of a coin flip earlier today. We begin with Mr. Hogsett, sir. Well, thank you uh, to Wish TV uh, for sponsoring tonight's debate. Uh, I come before the audience tonight asking for a third and final term because I simply want to finish the job. We. Uh, in ter we inherited uh, eight years ago a $50 million structural deficit, uh, and we resolved that within a year to a year and a half. Since that time, we have had seven fully funded, fully balanced budgets, seven consecutive, uh, all of which by uh, passed with bipartisan support, three of which uh, were unanimous. We've added 700 police officers. 45% of all IMPD have been hired in the Hogshead administration. Uh, we've had a 16% reduction in, in murders uh, in 2022. We've, we've enjoyed a 16% reduction so far this year in 2023. The IBJ reports there's $9 billion in new investment that's on its way to the city of Indianapolis over the next four to five years. We've passed a $1.2 billion infrastructure proposal with no new tax increases to address the critical infrastructure needs of our city. We've added um, $200 million to our park system. So those are some of the accomplishments of this administration. I'm proud of them, and I would like an opportunity to finish the job. Okay, Mr. Shreve, 90 seconds, close us out, sir. Uh, thank you. I think the, the question before your viewers and the voters is simply, are we better off as citizens of Indianapolis today than we were eight years ago? I don't believe we are, and I think the facts are pretty clear. Uh, the mayor has personally taken responsibility and is on record when our homicides were in the 100-ish level uh, per year. And we've had three years at the 200 level, and we, if we annualize where we are today, we'll be over 200 homicides again this year. Uh, in 2019, the mayor promised to tackle the homelessness problem. Clearly, that remains a challenge for our city. In 2021, he promised to get the animal shelter built, and there is no remediation progress in work at the other site that he just referenced. Uh, in 2017, the mayor opined that two terms was sufficient for a mayor to accomplish his objectives and his presence tonight is indicative that the work that he set out to do remains to be done, eight years into it. Uh, that also raises a question that, 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 that came earlier as to where the mayor's presence was on the nights of the riots of a few years ago when our city was so desperately in need of leadership. So I stand before you, the voters, to offer change to ask for the support of my neighbors and to request your vote. Well, Mr. Shreve and Mr. Hogg said, we want to thank you again for joining us tonight to answer questions in the critical race for the city. And we also want to thank you at home for watching. And a reminder that early voting is already underway in Marion County and Election Day is two weeks from tomorrow, November 7th. From all of us here at Wish TV, have a great rest of your night.